Welcome to Grace Fellowship Baptist Church Wednesday Evening Bible Study for Wednesday, March 23rd, 2022. Today is Saturday, March 19th, 2022. And tonight we are in the book of Ephesians, the sixth chapter, and we're going to start in verse 5. Um, but I uh, have to deal a little bit with some historical detail before we get there, because this is uh, dealing with slavery and uh, masters, and so we have to understand what slavery was in Greek society and Roman society um, and something of the historical context that is said here so that um, this passage has some meaning. Um, we here in the United States tend to think of slavery in the terms of the chattel slavery that was uh, very racist here in the United States where uh, certain skin tones were slaves automatically and if you were of that slave skin tone you were a slave and if you didn't have that skin tone you weren't a slave and only people of that skin tone were slaves and everybody of that skin tone was a slave. Um, that was not true in Greek and Roman society. Um, there were some differences Greek society, um, the slave was still viewed as a human being. They just didn't have full political rights. And uh, they could even have property rights. They could earn money on their own outside their slavery. Um, they had very limited um, legal rights. And Greeks actually had several different levels of slavery from um, literally some of the higher grades were public servants, uh, tax collectors, people like that, uh, craftsmen, um, and very important to society. Um, all the way down to uh, mine workers. Uh, in Both in Greek and uh, Roman society, mine workers were the lowest level of slave. Um, one ancient authority uh, put the average life expectancy once you were a mine slave at, at less than two years. So they were br uh, worked brutally and expected to die. Uh, it was very often uh, for both societies a punishment uh, for a heinous crime. Um, very often um, war slaves, captured war slaves, were used in the mines. Uh, mining was important in a collection of metal and ores were very important, but it's very dangerous work and uh, very hard. And um, so the people who did it were almost always slaves. Farm slaves were also another large uh, category. And uh, both in Greek and Roman society, there was uh, two kinds of farm slaves. One owned by the landowner and... Um, they were chattel slaves, uh, very similar to uh, American slavery, except they could be of any um, people group. Um, they worked the land, they could be beaten, they could be um, sold, they could be leased out, etc., etc. Um, while in Greek society, a uh, landowner could be charged with homicide for killing one of his slaves. Um, in Roman society, slaves were not viewed as people, and you were deprived of humanity when you were made into a slave. Uh, the Romans also used uh, got a lot of their slaves by uh, conquering people in war, and uh, the citizens would become slaves. So, um, uh, in the Greek, in the Roman society, um, killing a slave was uh, if you owned it. Uh, not a problem. Um, damaging one uh, through punishment or whatever. Um, then both Greek and Romans uh, had another kind of agricultural slave that the property owner owned the land, but the land owned the slave. And that um, level of slavery, you had to work the land and you had to it was hard work, but you could not be punished. It was the land that owned you, not the slave owner. And if the land was sold, 
you went with land. Um, you could not be removed from your land. And if you had property on that piece of property, it could not be removed from you. Um, very similar to the uh, European idea of the serf. Um, in fact, it's the idea that got European serfdom uh, in place. Um, but consequently, they had a lot of legal protection. And the um, slave that was owned by the land could not be hurt by, in war. So an invading army uh, finds a, essentially a serf working the land. They had to go around his garden, go around his food, go around his crops, could not touch him. Um, but you just didn't, you didn't mess with serfs and for any reason. The land owned them, and they had to produce agricultural crops. But other than that, they had a great deal of freedom as long as they stayed on their land. So your physical movement was restricted, but if you could earn money on your piece of land, you could build a house, you could, you could buy slaves even as a serf, both for the Greeks and the Romans. Um, <laughs> you know, um, kind of an interesting concept. Uh, then there was another big category of slaves, both in Re Greek and Roman society, was the household slave. In Greek society, um, they were chattel property, uh, but human, uh, very much like the um, uh, chattel property for um, agricultural land. And you could work them, you could um, punish them, um, in Greek society, because they were still human, um, if you killed one, it was a homicide. Uh, you could lease them out, uh, etc. In Roman society, though, they were considered part of the household, and while they had no humanhood, no personhood, um, they could own property and do work and earn money, and if the slave owner allowed it, they could earn their freedom in various ways. And a common way was you earned enough money on your own outside of your work for the household, uh, you could buy your freedom. Now, you were still part of the household, so you now were a free man in the household. And um, as such, the household had to provide for you, and um, they had to provide food and clothing and water and room, uh, some place to sleep and bedding and um, treat illnesses and that kind of thing. Um, and a freed slave could not be re-enslaved. Um, now, in Greek society, you, you were a person, but... Um, the only, you couldn't really be freed uh, from slavery. And the only real option you had, if you could outrun your master, is run to a temple. Now, most towns and cities had more than one temple, and a good-sized city would have a bunch of temples. So, you know, very often it was only four or five blocks to a nearest temple. Uh, if you could get to the temple... In the temple, you had the right to request the priest sell you to a new owner, that the, your current owner had lost his right to your services, and you, you could then request that a new owner purchase you. And the temple would make the arrangements, and a new owner would get you, and you could go with you would go with them. Um, the idea is if a slave owner mistreated his slaves, he could lose them through uh, illegal means uh, without any compensation, and somebody else would get the labor who would treat them fairer. Um, a lot of Greek philosophers um, did po point out 
that it benefited you to treat your slave well because it, it, the same way it benefited you to treat your oxen that plowed your field well. A strong ox could plow better. A healthy slave could work better, uh, could do more for you. Um, Roman society uh, recognized that um, they basically borrowed from the Greeks the concept of, uh, you know, treating your slaves well uh, meant you were more profitable and more uh, economically prosperous. Um, the Romans also had this uh, slavery model where the state owned the slave. And, it, and this person was not actually owned by any individual. And uh, it took a legal process to punish any slave in that kind of position because it was owned by the collective government. And a lot of those slaves did work for the government. They were accountants. They were tax collectors. They were, yeah, tax collectors were slaves in Roman society, in, in great parts of the empire. Um, you know, they, they did the functions of the government. They were the bureaucracy. Um, and as such, um, actually commanded quite a, um, uh, 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 societal, um, honor. Um, a lot of the, uh, Famous bureaucrats in Rome were slaves of the Roman government, um, uh, and as such, um, actually held greater honor in many cases than free people that were not economically well off. And um, a lot of the high-ranking bureaucrats in the Roman government were slaves, uh, and you were a slave of the government. And as such. Um, no citizen could punish you. It had to be a magistrate that ordered it, and only on um, a appropriate presentation of evidence. In other words, somebody who wanted to punish you had to go before the magistrate and lay out the evidence that said this slave needs to be punished for this reason, and if it was not legally proven, uh, the slave was acquitted and was not punished. If the slave was convicted of the whatever he was accused of, then the accuser still had to go through a second part of the process and state what punishment needed to be provided, and the magistrate had to agree to it. And if they didn't agree, they could change it, uh, increase it, decrease it, uh, change what it was. Um, and so, you know, they could be fined, they could be whipped, they, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but um, the magistrates had a great deal of um, authority in that. And um, there was many cases where magistrates were very loath to uh, punish the slaves that worked in the government with them, or uh, I should say for them in one sense, because the magistrates depend upon their labor to do their job. And so you accuse the magistrate slave of needing to be punished, uh, if the slave was doing a good job for the magistrate, the magistrate really didn't want to punish the guy. Um, and so um, the, the slaves of the government was actually a very honored position. Um, they were people who were sometimes very learned. The Greek also had societies had some slaves in the government very similar and they were very often people like uh, philosophers and teachers and um, tutors to the um, children uh, very well off and um, as such were also honored very greatly by society in fact some of them had more better reputations than free men so um, just kind of a brief uh, rundown. Uh, Greek uh, language had at least two different word, two dozen different words for different kinds of slaves. Um, 
and we're going to look at the specific meaning Paul used here. Um, because um, he he used he used a very specific word for a very specific reason. Um, Romans had basically uh, four words for slaves, and um, it had to do more with their function in society. One of them was the civil servant. Uh, one of them was the household worker. One of them was an agricultural worker, and one of them was the agricultural worker that was owned by the land. Um, so, um, you know, the, the Roman view had a lot less distinction in your character, but uh, in your uh, role. Greeks had so many words for it, and uh, some of them got uh, used at different points in history in interchangeable ways, and then, you know, at one point in time, they'd be separate, they'd be used interchangeably, later they'd be separated back out and used differently than they had been used classically or in the in-between time. So, uh, Greek uh, slavery was, while it's wrote, written about more, it's harder to decipher exactly what they did. The Romans wrote their laws down, and we largely have uh, copies of those laws. And um, so, consequently, we know a lot more about the legal status of Roman slaves than we do the Greek status. Um, paradoxically, in the first century where Paul's writing this, uh, both the Roman and the Greek slavery um, systems were in place in Greek society. In Roman society, they didn't use the Greek structure at all. In Greek society, they used the Greek structure predominantly, but the Romans being in charge of the government, the Roman structure was also used. Um, one of the interesting things, Ephesus was one of the major slave trading cities. It was a, it had a large slave market, and um, at various points in time, depending upon uh, the success of the Roman armies at generating slaves by conquering people, um, they sold as many as 50,000 slaves a day in Ephesus. Um, the Romans did tax slave trade. 2% uh, of the sale price went to the uh, Roman government. And um, at various points in time, a uh, very large uh, number, large revenue uh, to the Romans was ensued there. Um, the Roman system of uh, making slaves by capturing uh, conquered people, uh, when the Roman general had won, if he didn't had negotiated uh, a treaty in the process, would basically have, well, there would be slave traders that followed the army around. And when they captured people, the general would get a price for giving these captured people to the slave traders, um, who then had the responsibility of providing for them, feeding them, transporting them, and selling them. And uh, they would make a profit then at selling them at the other end. Um, uh, both Greek and Roman law it required that when you sold a slave at market, they could not be clothed in any clothes because you could not hide anything about what they were. Uh, there was uh, an exception in the Roman system. Uh, there were certain kind of slaves that would have a hat put on uh, their head uh, to indicate their status. Um, and what they could be used for would be restricted. Uh, depending upon what hat they wore, they could only be worked in a mine or only be worked in agricultural work or they had a propensity for having escaped a previous master. Um, so, um, you know, the hat they wore 
it was indicative. Uh, you wanted to be a slave that didn't have a hat on. <laughs> I just hate to tell you that. Um, uh, it meant something poorly was going to happen to you. Um, but consequently, the um, buyer knew something about you and had to take precautions. Now let's read uh, what Paul wrote. Ephesians 6, chapter 6, verse 5. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor uh, when, you're, when their eye is on you, but like slaves of Christ, doing the war, will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men, because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether he is slave or free. Um, the word that Paul uses here for slave is the same one he uses for himself as a servant of Jesus. It's a bond servant. Um, it's somebody who had been free at one point in time and had become the slave to another, um, generally voluntarily, uh, very rarely uh, involuntarily. In Greek society, you could involuntarily become a bond servant, basically by getting in such deep enough debt that uh, there was no way to pay the debt, and the debtor could either sell you into bond slavery to try to recover some money, or make you his slave so that he could recover the money through your labors the rest of your life. Um, bond servants did have the ability to uh, free themselves, and um, they had more legal rights than many other kinds of slaves. But they were also expected to work for their masters um, somewhat willingly. You, they would be given a great deal of freedom. Um, people who sold their children into slavery in Greek society very often sold them into bond slavery because a bond servant could not be mistreated as easily as the other kinds of slaves. And um, so, but they also had legal rights. Um, you know, if the master was punishing the slave and got too enthusiastic in the punishment and damaged the slave, um, in some Greek uh, cities, the slave could be freed for, or their price to be manumitted reduced. Um, Christianity then added a different wrinkle to this, and Paul is pointing this out here, and it gets expounded on by the early church fathers a great deal more, in that Christianity recognized that every slave was a human being, made in God's image, just as any free person was made in God's image, and therefore had inalienable uh, rights. Um, here in the United States, when we say that, we hearken back to the uh, Declaration of Independence and uh, inalienable rights of, uh, you know, life and, you know, etc. Uh, pursuit of happiness, and all that. Um, we, we think of those kind of things. That was not a concept yet in Greek society. Uh, it's a late, much later development. Um, the, the Europeans borrow from both the Greeks and the Romans, and um, as they interact with Christianity and this concept that everybody's made in the image of God, and we have these characteristics that, that come from God, and uh, we have worth because we're made in the image of God. And early Christians recognized that slaves could be saved. It wasn't just free men that could be saved, but everybody. And if God accepted you, why should man reject you? <laughs> you know, and that in um, that as that 
thought develops and the um, European concept of slavery and serfdom uh, change and meld and uh, grow and shrink through the years, the legal rights of different classes of people change. Uh, being made in the image of God meant that there were certain kinds of things you um, couldn't expect of slaves that you couldn't uh, require of them. And then um, we took a weird turn here in North America with the slavery of Africans and um, took a a very backwards take there that um, just because of the color of their skin they were inherently slaves and had no um, human rights and had no uh, but even here uh, we recognize they could be born again and should be Christians in one sense um, and therefore were full brothers and sisters with us in Christ a very big contradiction. Um, but here Paul states it for the first time that um, the slaves were to obey their masters. And this does come under his um, uh, statement in chapter 5, verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So... Um, He's specifically talking here to Christian slaves, um, that you're Christian and you're enslaved to a master, then you should be working for your master just like you do your heavenly master. Yes, you're enslaved to Jesus Christ like anybody else that was a Christian. And that should motivate you to do what your master needs without him having to punish you, without him having to watch you. You should be better at working for him. Um, in many senses, the bond slaves were the societal equivalent of wage slaves today. A large section of our population today is a, quote, free, but they'll never ever be free because they never earn enough money to be able to make their own choices. Um, their debts that they have to have uh, to buy food and clothing and shelter and transportation and their needs meet or exceed their income. So they're continually living paycheck to paycheck working um, without being able to get ahead. In Greek society, the bond slave was that equivalent. Um, the Greeks just dispensed with the financial system. Uh, if you were a bond slave, you didn't get any money for your labors. You got food and clothing and shelter and a bed. And you worked for those things and those things were given to you and all your profit of profit then went to the master um, not all that different than the unjust system we have here in the United States today um, where a lot of people are working and the profits go to the distant corporations or the owners of the corporations or whatever um, without seeing the profits from your own labor. Um, we're, we're not any better or worse than Greek society in that sense. Technically, slavery where somebody's property of another is outlawed, but it still happens. Um, it's illegal, but uh, people figure out how to get around it, get not caught, uh, and think they get away with it. But the Christian 
I'm, I'm going to say this, if you're an employer, an employee, and you're a Christian, you are told by God to work for your employer like you were working for him. Um, Paul lays this out. Um, you're to submit to the other to meet their needs. Now, that's not to say that you're not supposed to pray for justice or pray for um, right treatment, etc. Um, but it's God who will reward you. This life is only, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 years if you have a great strength, 120 if you have very great strength. You know, um, you're going to be rewarded in eternity forever by what you do here, too. Um, work for as if you're working for God because God's the one you're really working for for the long term. You, you only work, you know, 40 years or so in this life. Um, we do have a retirement system where you can quit working, um, even if you're a wage slave. Later, um, Paul in other places says to slaves, if you can earn your freedom, do so. It's it's well worth having. Um, Paul clearly says, sees that there's an injustice in human beings owning other human beings. Um, but he's also not trying to change society. It's not his point. It's his point to produce spiritual freedom that slaves can be born again and as such, uh, you know, if they can better themselves, that's fine. But in the meantime, they need to be doing what they should be doing to the best of their ability. Um, and not be a problem, uh, a problem for their masters. Not be troublesome. To be profitable. And to be working diligently, whether anybody's watching them or not. Because to tell you the truth, in Greek society, and even to a great extent in Roman society, a slave that profited their master greatly would be given more responsibility and more freedom and more protection and, um, you know, in Roman society, kind of the ideal is you worked hard enough for your master that he was willing to sell you to the state and you'd be a slave of the state and be a well-educated uh, slave that could um, even tell free men what to do. Um, a lot of the overseers of slaves, whether you were talking about a household or a farm, were indeed themselves slaves that had worked their way up the system and had earned responsibilities and um, therefore earned privileges. And um, in both Greek and Roman system, uh, the overseers in the, uh, were very often, and the uh, stewards of the house and stuff were uh, slaves themselves, but they could administer punishment for the owners. They had that kind of freedom, that kind of responsibility. And um, as such, um, you know, had uh, free men kind of uh, responsibilities and capabilities and privileges. And so he's, he's saying a very practical thing. Work as if you're working for the Lord and you can better your position in society. Um, if you're an employer, employee, work as if you're working for the Lord and See if you can get that job promotion. 
it fits the same logic today. Okay, we don't call it slavery. We don't call them bond slaves. We call them employees. We have a financial system where we pretend to pay you and then tell you you're responsible for your own goods. But in a real sense, it's a kind of slavery where you'll never get ahead, statistically. Some, some people will. And some people may even get, manage to get out from underneath that and become fully independent. And you're supposed to do this labor for your master, for your employer, because you know God will reward you. Thing is, Paul never promises you a reward in this life. He knows this life is evil, fallen, broken mess, where very often you don't get rewarded for the good you do. When he says God will reward you, he's explicitly making the promise that God will see the injustice done to you and reward you in eternity. So, go to work, whether you have a good boss or not, and work as if you were working for God, because you're working for God. And your pay is not just here in this life. God still has a payment system in eternity for you. Be earning that reward. Okay, verse 9. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. And again, Paul is talking here to Christians who own slaves. And he's basically saying, treat them as fellow human beings because your master, Jesus Christ, is their master and will reward and punish you according to how well you treat your people. So if you're a boss, if you're a supervisor, if you're the owner of a business, if you're the employer or the person working for the employer, treat your employees correctly. You should not have wage slaves here in America. You should be paying a, more than a living wage if they're doing profitable work. If they're not doing profitable work, you should be yeah, intervening with them to make them more profitable so that you can pay them a living wage. You're supposed to be Submitting to one another. Masters are supposed to be submitting to their slaves. Employers are supposed to be submitting to their employees. We talked about that mutual submission. It still applies here. You are the servant to make sure that the employee has the tools it takes, the resources it takes, the goods it takes to do the work you need him to do. Part of your job is to make sure he can do his job to the best of his ability. If you're both doing the job right, both of you will profit from it. And you as the employee should be making sure some of that profit goes to him for doing it. So our system here in North America where we have billionaires, oligarchs, if you will, who take all the profit of society, anti-biblical. And by the way, our American billionaires with their ownership of the company uh, elitism, 
are no different than the Russian oligarchs. They just haven't managed to get a dictator in charge yet. Be very careful who you vote for. Make sure you don't pick the dictator they want. Oh, but if you're in that employer relationship to somebody else, do the best for them you can. Serve their needs so that they can serve your needs. Uh, it's been said that an employee's job is to make the boss look good. It's the boss's job to make sure the employees are organized and skilled and have what it takes to do the job well so the boss looks well. You're to motivate, not by threats. You're to motivate by a personal relationship and benefit to them. And that comes from Paul. And do understand that Jesus does not show favoritism. If you're a billionaire, if you're the small business owner, if you're the supervisor, if you're the worker, God treats you all the same. You are all lost in sin. It was by His grace you were forgiven and brought into redemption with Him and made a full adopted heir of Christ, in Christ Jesus. You're no different in God's standing than anybody else, no matter where you are on the economic ladder. So if you're a waste slave, hold up your head. God's got you. If you're the billionaire that has hundreds of millions of people working for you, stay humble. Because before Jesus Christ, you are no different, no better than the lowest ranked minimum wage employee you have. Lord Jesus, help us to understand our bondship, our bondservantness to you, and that we serve you. Uh, have us be motivated by serving you, no matter what we do uh, in our daily work, that we will work as if we're working for you, to do our best for you, uh, to work hard, to be motivated, to do things correctly. And help us to treat our fellow employees, our employers, uh, well. Uh, anybody that we have lower than us in the organization, that we would treat them well. Have us to be those people who see with spiritual eyes that there is no difference in one human being and another. And Lord, help us to be people who push for in our society that very egalitarian ideal that you see us all the same. That it's not how much of the goods of this world we have, but it's our standing before you as sinners receiving grace or as sinners rejecting that grace. In your holy, holy, holy name, I hope to see you there Wednesday night, and if I don't, I will see you here again next week, and I hope to see you soon. Have a blessed week.